All right, we've got a few more coming in and then we're gonna go ahead and get going. We've got a lot to do today, which is very exciting. So we're gonna do a little bit of, um, a little bit of housekeeping first and then we're going to do some introductions. And I think Brenda, we're starting with you with the introductions, is that right? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, let me keep, still got people coming in, so. And you're gonna do the housekeeping? Yeah, yeah, I'll okay, do that good. here real quick. Okay. Make sure I'm recording this, I am. All right, well, people are coming in. Okay, so welcome to the Bridges to Employment webinar series. This is the second part where last time we learned all about uh, Medicaid buy-in. That session has been recorded and posted on our website. So you can find that uh, there under training if you take a look for it. If you need, sorry, one second, let's admit this person. If you need a little help finding it, shoot me an email. I'm Angela Nevin. I'm the director of training for CCDC. So a couple things real quick. Um, please leave your videos off to maximize bandwidth. Um, we know that Zoom gets overloaded sometimes. Questions you have, please put them in the chat box. We will take a couple breaks where we can do some uh, Q&A and any questions that we don't get answered, um, you will get via email after the presentation. Actually, you'll get all the questions we do answer too. Um, again, we're recording this presentation, let you know when it's available, and you will get a copy of the slides. Um, so don't worry about taking notes, everything will be available for you. So without hesitation, I'm going to introduce uh, Brenda Mosby to you from our board of directors. I'm going to let her do a little bit more introduction because I always flub that stuff. So let's get going. Hi, Brenda. Welcome to Hi. everyone. All right. Um, Angela, maybe two more um, housekeeping. I don't know oh. if you put um, CCDC's website address in the in the chat. It was no, but it is at okay. the end. But um, okay. just so you know, it is pretty simple. It's ccdconline.org. So, and also um, we do have cart for. We have, we actually have auto. Um, we have auto captioning enabled. Oh. So if you need the captions, it is there for you. Um, and we will be making the transcript available along with the video. So. Okay, thank you. Hello, right. everyone. Hello, everyone. It's so great to see you again. And thank you so much for um, attending the webinar. Um, I, I believe in the statement, knowledge is power. And the more you learn and understand what you need to be successful, what bridges are available to you for an employment success, um, the greater things will become in, in your life. Again, my name is Brenda Mosby. I am the owner and operator of Mosby Services. And one of those services that I provide is employment for people with disabilities. I have been doing this for over 20 years. It is my life's passion. I totally enjoy it. Um, my friend is, I was told is here, Bill Estrada, the president and owner of Team EEI. And he is your technology expert. If you need to know something about technology, he's the man. And this is going to be a very in-depth um, seminar today. So I'm just going to turn it over to Dawn and let Dawn introduce herself and Donna. Hi, this is Dawn Howard. I'm the director of community organizing for CCDC. Um, I would love to talk to any of you um, about how to get involved in doing advocacy work. And my office number is 303-531-7333. There are many opportunities to get involved. Thank you. Don, before you introduce Donna, um, Angela, could you go ahead and put our contact information into the chat? I think you have mine, my email and phone number. I will, give me a few moments to do it. I'm 
got some. Oh, you don't have to do it right now. Sometime yep, I'll make it. sure it's in there. Thank you. Okay, Don. And I'll pass it over to Donna Sablon, the CCDC Director of Medicaid Appeals and Eligibility. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to go over today how to do the state disability determination portion, which is a required component for anyone who is not on SSDI or has rolled out of Social Security disability. We're going to go over briefly a little review of last week. And one of the options for people who are working, who have qualifying disabilities, is Medicaid buy-in. For you have to work and have a qualifying disability. Work means work for pay. You do not have to work full time, but you have to receive actual pay and you have to do actual work. With Medicaid buy-in, there is a premium based on your income. And we're going to go over that calculation as we go um, through the slide. Angela, next one, please. So today we're going to look at the Medicaid buy-in application and disability determination app. We're also going to look at the releases that are required if you want someone at CCDC to assist you in the process. So there's the third party release of information. There are medical releases for the actual disability determination process and proof of work. Next one, Angela, please. Okay, so when, actually the first thing people freak out about truthfully is before they start the process is what is my premium going to be to purchase Medicaid buy-in? Now, we're going to use the tallies here of um, earned income, 965. When you're doing earned income, you get to subtract a whopping $65 which makes your income 900, you divide it by two, which is $450, is what you would then look at the chart and your premium for Medicaid buy-in at that same level would be $25 a month. It's more tedious and more costly for a good reason. When you have unearned income, you only get to subtract $20. So if your unearned income from anything, it could be Social Security, it could be a pension, it could be a settlement, anything at all you do not earn, including interest. So in this example, we're going to use $220 minus 20 is 200. But remember, you have to be working. So you have to add the 200 plus the 450 
to get $650 and your premium in this example is still going to be $25 a month to purchase Medicaid buy-in. Now, when you're purchasing Medicaid buy-in, you're purchasing Medicaid. So with this, you get all the benefits that you would get with Medicaid. You would get regular Medicaid to go to the doctors. You get um, long-term care. You get dental. So you get everything. Now, to begin the process, the first thing we have to do is go through the Medicaid application. Now, I did find out something um, just received recently, a smaller application. If you are already on Medicaid and you start to work, for example, or your income uh, is going up, I do have a smaller application we'll include in the link we I just like literally got it, um, which makes it easier. But we are going to assume in this example, you do not have Medicaid. So we are going to go through this application. It's the same application you would use for any Medicaid program. When you're doing buy-in, you are only filling this out for the person who is applying for Medicaid buy-in. It is a e single person program. You are not committing fraud by not including your spouse or your family members. This program is specifically for the individual applying for Medicaid buy-in. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to use um, Miss Angela here as our um, test person for doing the app again. Guinea pig, Donna, guinea pig. <laughs> okay, guinea pig. <laughs> so what we are going to do is we're going to keep this form focused to person one. Remember, very specifically, this is only for the person applying for Medicaid buy-in. So Ms. Angela puts her name, her address, her city, her county, her contact information. You can use phone number. You can use email. The system does not care. Next slide, please. Okay. So remember on the right side of the screen you're looking at, self. You, you person one, you are the only one you are going to be filling this application out for. So you're going to put your gender, your birth date, social security. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. We're not going to go into those things. Just we're going to do a simple app. Um are you filing taxes, yes or no? Will you file with the spouse? In this case, for our example, we put yes. It will not make a difference in the end. Why? Because Medicaid buy-in is only tallied on your earned and unearned income. Simple. The form needs to be filled out accurate, but don't like freak out because a lot of this stuff will not apply to you or your family members or your spouse on the outcome of what you pay and your eligibility. 
Next one, please. Okay, so do you need health coverage? Well, you're applying for this because you do need health coverage. Now, that's question eight. Now, what we need to be very um, specific about is question 10. Do you have a medical or developmental condition that has lasted or is expected to last more than 12 months? Generally, if you are applying for Medicaid buy-in, you do have those conditions. Even with, for those people who have had COVID, for example, um, the data is showing even if you've had COVID, some of these symptoms and residuals are lasting more than 12 months. So they are expected to last. You can you need to mark yes. Now, do you need question 11? Do you need help with some or all of self-care activities such as dressing, bathing, eating, uh, using the bathroom? That's for question 11 is for long-term care disability. Not everyone needs that. It's a specific separate criteria. And if you do not need that and cannot prove you need that, you do not have to mark that yes. You mark it no. Well, can you, thank you. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. I'm probably going a little slower too. Now, question 14, very, very, very important question as well. Do you need Medicaid to help you pay for medical bills from the last three months? Whether you have other insurance, Medicare could be private or whatnot, I always suggest marking that. Why? Because it takes 90 days, 93 months to run a Medicaid buy-in application from beginning to end. So if you want to get your full um, coverage, whether you need it or not, mark it. It does not hurt you. It helps you if you don't have medical bills or um, everything's covered by, let's say, Kaiser, or you're only paying a dollar thirty for your meds through Medicare and you don't want to use it. You don't have to, but use the options available to us to at least protect your position and needs if you have them. Next one, please. Okay, so again, member, upper left side of your form, person one. So now you can or can, ethnicity is optional. Optional. Here's why I said, always ask the question when I'm working with people. Are you Native American or Native Alaskan? That's important. If you are and can prove that multiple ways, then you do not pay co-pays for your appointments or premiums. Now, that could change depending on Congress or how with COVID budgets are tightening, but it's really important. If you are of that genetics, you do have rights again, make sure you use what you have available. Were you uninsured in the last six months? Yes or no makes 
no real difference except again to figure our demand as a state. Are we going to expect more people to be on Medicaid, to be able for the state and orgs like us to go, why weren't you on insurance? What happened to fill those gaps? If you have a doctor, in this case, remember we are doing Medicaid buy-in. Medical documentation will be need. So if you feel comfortable, Mark, yes, put your doctor's name down. It's just going to help in the other process that we're going to go through with the state disability um, determination process. You will fill out your jobs. If you have two part-time jobs, okay, that's fine. It does not make a difference. Medicaid buy-in, you must have a job that you are paid by proof that you are actually doing. Next slide, please. Sorry, Donna, I just want real quick, one of the questions that we did have that we could answer real fast was how yeah, does it work course. for independent contractors? Independent contractors, if they, it, they are eligible, like real estate, I am going to give a red flag warning. It depends how you are paid. Remember, you can only have your maximum income per the chart about 4,000 a month. So if you are like real realtors, if you are going to try not to get a 10 or $12,000 payment in one month, try to see if you can break it up. Otherwise, if it can income average correctly, you're going to knock yourself out at eligibility for specific months. So, and contractors come under where we are, question 33, self-employed. Add that stuff in there so you may be able to have some of that contracting income be reduced by putting that information in here, your expenses, business, mortgage, um, utilities. And let me just make a reminder, utilities, people forget about. It's not just power, it's water, it's trash. It's, it may be um, having to, depending on where you live, pay to when it snows, have your sidewalk clean. Make sure you include everything and make sure, make sure you have backup receipts. You will be asked to provide those just like any other program. So, Again, we're upper left-hand corner of the form, person one. This, uh, be as accurate as you can here. I know capital gains changes, spousal maintenance is usually sad. Um, unemployment. Normally, unemployment means you're not working. In COVID rules, and we're not going to go into that right now for this purpose right here, um, generally means no, you're not working. Or you're going to prove with your unemployment check you're working three out of five days. Totally on unemployment won't work. Um, Social Security, how are you getting it? Was that a one-time payment? Was that a back payment? Retirement. Um, 
spousal maintenance is an earned income if you get it, just like capital gains, dividends and interest, farming would be earned income. And rental property, um, if you are running your property, you may potentially with proof be considered you are employed doing that. A royalty would be unearned income. Um, spousal maintenance, all this stuff will not count. Deductions do not count in Medicaid buy-in. There is no disregards. You will fill them out accurately and they will not count. Um, next page, please. So remember, we're doing person one. Where it goes to person two, we are going to ignore those. We are not going to do those. But if you are of a member of a federally recognized American Indian or Native Alaskan tribe, you are going to go to step three and fill that out. It's really important. I mean, you know, use your benefit abilities. Then there's um, the worksheet, the health coverage. Step four, if you have insurance, including Medicaid, private insurance, even if you may be on regular Medicaid, List it. You're going from one program type into another program type. There's VA Health, Peace Corps. Again, try count, try care for the military, employer insurance, none Kaiser. None of these are going to eliminate you from Medicaid buy-in. Medicaid can be what's called a secondary insurance. Some people have three insurances, Medicare, Medicare Supplemental, and Medicaid. You could have one insurance, TRICARE, because your spouse in the military, and our uh, guinea pig here, Angela, she may have Kaiser. And then she wants Medicaid buy-in. That is appropriate. You can do that. Just list everything here on the form and don't think you're not eligible. Next one, please. So there are only a couple of pages where you need to sign. You need to sign in date. Page 11, if you are using an electronic signature, it must be able to show date, and some of them show time, but it has to be a legal time stamp or they have to kick it back. They can't verify it you. Make sense? We have to make sure we protect each other. Um if you're not registered to vote, fill it out on that page. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So again, on page 18 is where you are also going to sign your form. This one, you're going to print it. You're going to sign it. You're going to date it. Now, Number 10, let us let me address that because I've been seeing a couple questions flash up. Number 10, are you on SSI or SSDI? If you are on SSI, you are not Medicaid buy-in eligible. SSI includes two programs, SSI and 1619B. You are not Medicaid eligible because you are mandatory med. 
the only way to become Medicaid buy in eligible is to see if you can roll to SSDI or you have to um, work with Social Security to do a rollover. The state and county cannot switch you over to Medicaid buy-in until Social Security sends an official um, notice you are no longer mandatory med under SSI. Um, Donna, um, yes. I, I didn't want to cut you off. I've got, we do have a few questions I think that would pertain to this. Do you want me to read them? Of course. All right. One, um, we talked about the independent contractors. Um, so I think that covers it. Um, Kevin asks, at some point, will we cover tax refunds and stimulus checks? They don't care. Okay. Tax refunds and stimulus checks do not count against this. They're not earned income. They're not earned unearned income for Medicaid buy-in. Unless Congress changes the rule. <laughs> Always realize what I am telling you now is fact You that can be found because we give you resources that is subject to change depending on what the state or federal government does in the future. Right now, no, they are not. All right. Um, then we have sorry. Um, if someone has Medicaid due to the pandemic emergency, does that count as part of this program as having Medicaid long term? Um, Jennifer, maybe she can uh, clarify a little. Let me see here. So, Do you when, want to clarify? Yeah, if she can. Go okay. ahead, Jennifer. So um, I was told I, I, the only reason that I have Medicaid is because of the emergency, because of the pandemic. Um, and so I right now I still have, I have Medicaid, but I don't know when that state of emergency is deemed to be over. It just, it's a little confusing for me, but right now I have Medicaid because of COVID-19. So if a dynamics change to where somebody has a disability and is now working, making more money, and could be Medicaid by ineligible, after COVID, the recommendation we have, and most counties do, is run your buy-in app. What happens at the end of the emergency is anybody who is questionable or presumptive is going to have to fill out a redetermination anyway and send in all your proof, your bank income, if you're going for long-term care, um, your proof of income. So if you got a redetermination, fill it out. If you got one of those letters, we're going to kick you off. They can't kick you off until um, you, they go through the whole formal denial process. So once you're on, you are with COVID, you have all of the eligible, you have all of the rights of due process as if you, just because it was COVID doesn't take away your due process rights to hearings and such. Yeah, absolutely. But that letter is not, that particular letter, we did take um, a case into the OAC Medicaid court. And what the judge said, yeah, they're letters. They're not notices. You can't be kicked off. So don't trip about those letters. They're letters. They're not formal notice. 
Okay. Let's stick with Jennifer for a second here. She said, yeah. uh, cause you had another one. Uh, sorry, I have to find it here. Where'd it go? You guys are putting messages in here as fast as it'll go. Um, sorry, well, hang on. If I already oh, have SSDI. Yeah, you already have SSDI. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> would, uh, if you already have SSDI, would my answers be different to any of these questions on the form? No, you would just mark where it said, are you on, do you have SSI or SSDI? You would mark yes. I'm on SSDI. I work. That is probably... 50% of the people who um, are on Medicaid buy-in. Mm -hmm. So you're, and, and once we get a little further, um, so I'm going to go off on tangent to ask your question, answer part of your question. <laughs> if you're on SSI or SSDI, you have already been determined disabled. You do not have to do state disability determination because the federal government already said you are disabled. Your SSDI income, that is unearned income. What you're earning working is going to be minus 65 cut in half. We who are working on SSDI definitely pay a higher premium. We do. But here's where we get a benefit. So we pay roughly $144 a month for Medicare. My Medicaid premium is $100 buy-in is $130. I'm saving $14. That's going in my pocket. So everything is always perspective. I think Sorry. I understand that. <laughs> we can, we can uh, circle back around afterwards if you have more right. questions, okay? Thank yep. you. Um, okay, Kevin says, if we are in 1619B during the health crisis, can we switch to buy-in? Would you want to, maybe, is the question. Um, Social Security has to release your SSI case. It, think of Social Security as the IRS, if you watch the news, they're really behind. So they will probably not release you right away to be Medicaid by ineligible. They have to literally release it. I sounds complicated, like maybe that's a one on one. Yeah, and you know. Okay, Medicaid buy-in is optional. It is. Coming off an SSI program is risky unless you know for sure you would be able to roll into SSDI. Please remember, we, we don't even know what the Supreme Court is going to do with the Obamacare ruling. You are protected if you are on SSI, including 1619B. You are protected on buy-in because we use different funding through our state legislature. We don't know about anybody else. We can't say yes. We can't say no. We need to wait for that decision which we're all still waiting for, every citizen who's on this. Resources right. do not matter on buy-in. We're going to, they do not matter. You, When you look at the Medicaid app or 
long-term care app, Medicaid buy-in waives that you get. You get long-term care with it if you are functionally eligible and resources and assets do not count. All right. Um, somebody asked, can they have a link to the last webinar? Yes, but you have to wait till I'm done with the presentation because I can't get out of it to get it <laughs> back in. So, but we'll make sure you get that. Um, can you give an example of proving you are working, especially if it's for a fa if you work for a family member? So um, usually, what happens, and we have a lot of that. We have grandparents who um, watch their grandkids. We have people who house it once a month. We have another client who takes trash out for. Um, someone with a disability, you need a quick letter. So-and-so, um, Don is going to take trash out for um, Mr. Smith every week. I am going to pay her $12 a week to take out my four trash cans. And then... Mr. Smith will either sign a receipt or write a check. You have to prove it. And if somebody were to, some counties will do spot checks on different things, they better see you taking that trash out. Angela? <laughs> yes. Can I make a suggestion? Um, we, we probably still have a ways to go on the application yes. itself. So yep. <laughs> maybe what we'll do is ask, you know, three questions because they're getting very personal. And Yep, that's actually where we were going to go next. Um, there's a few more in there and we will, uh, yeah, if we can, we'll signal back around. If not, yeah, we'll let's sure do that. Answers. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's move on to the determination, disability determination. So... State disability determination, remember, is for those who are not currently on SSI or SSDI. When you're looking at this form, you're going to have typical questions, name, social security number, mailing address, phone number, um, Someone who can contact. Now, you'll see as we go further why that's going to be important if it applies. But remember, when you are doing this, this form and what Arbor, A-R-G, is supposed to determine is that you meet social security level of disability. It does not mean you are going to be SSI or SSDI eligible. It just means that when they're assessing disability, it impacts you enough that you are considered disabled. So you are going to see questions about your disability. Answer them to the best of your ability, including how do your conditions limit your ability to work? Some of you um, may have um, accommodations, for example, that you don't even realize that you're able to work from home or you have a special keyboard or you have special tech, um, things like that. Those are conditions and accommodations that you have that you do want to list. They are very important, not only in determining disability, but also in my opinion, from all these years, is it gets you to be comfortable 
with knowing what you need and who you are. So in our sample, needs to sleep during workout work hours, needs tech compatible with hearing aids. Unexpected things can trigger anxiety, including project or demands made unexpectedly. Depression impacts deadlines and ability to deliver on time. Anxiety is extreme in crowded situation rooms or groups. So be as visual as you can. It does not, um, it's important. Don't be shamed about it. That's who you are. That's what you need to be successful and work. And working is good. It makes you feel good mentally, physically. So remember that. Um, make any job-related uh, changes. Do you work fewer hours? Do you have change job duties? The most common one is extra time. Another common one is um, you have to go to the doctors every week or two weeks. And your employer goes, yeah, you can do that. You may have an option to make up that time, work in a uh, compensation, just make it up. Or you may say, you know what, yeah, I'm good. I'm not going to get paid. But the fact is, you're not going to get fired. So those are accommodations. Um, you want to list them as specifically as you can. Are you working now? Remember, if you are not working, you are not going to be Medicaid by ineligible. Why is that on here? Remember, it is because they have to use the Social Security standard in order to um, meet the criteria of what Congress created when they created these dual programs. Okay. Very important. So I see this all the time, and it literally gives me more gray hair than I already have. If you apply for Social Security Disability, SSI or SSDI, before you do state disability determination, whether you're allowed, denied, have to go through appeal, or you're still pending, there are a whole nother set of criterias that have to be met and timelines that are going to hurt you. That where I'm going to have to say, for example, I can't help you do this to apply until you have had no communication with Social Security for a period of months. Why? Because that's in the rules. So please, if you're on disability, you don't do this, Social Security. If not, and you're going for long-term care Medicaid, for example, and they go, you need disability determination. Don't do that until you complete this. All the state re and single entry point for long-term care, all they really need is to know you have been determined disabled. Now, determining disability, 
most people do not realize um, what's being actually looked for. There are different categories. So you meet Colorado. Am I? I think I'm just, okay, one, you have a disability. You will receive a different letter that will tell you if you qualify for Health First Colorado benefits. Okay, if you have a disability and you're applying for buy-in, yeah, good. Unless your income is so high that they have to explain income averaging or you make way too much. Rare cases, I do see it happen occasionally. Two, you meet Colorado's standard for limited disability, but do not meet the Social Security Administration's full disability standard. That means that you will get Medicaid buy-in. You may be long-term care eligible, but if you put a Social Security application in, yeah, not going to get it. And you probably won't get it in the appeal. Just from what I've seen. I'm not an attorney. This is from my experience. Just from what I see. From eligibility. Um, Social Security Administration has decided you do not have a full disability and you do not meet Colorado's disability standards. If you get one of those, you cannot reapply for 12 months. So if you applied for Social Security and then you do this, you have to wait before you can reapply. There may be exception timelines, depending if diagnosis change severity, but it's quite difficult to do. We'll do them occasionally if we see an exorbitant amount of evidence, because we can help you if we don't see, have the evidence to prove it. Four. Social Security already approved you, your disability. Boom, you're disabled. Don't worry about it. And then Social Security has already decided you do not have a disability. Let me be very, very clear. Like it says here, if you would agree with the decision. You can appeal that with Social Security. CCDC does not do Social Security appeals. Like I had said before, if you have a new or critical diagnosis, this form may be able to run under that new diagnosis or exacerbated one if you are not going to apply for Social Security right away. Why? Because you're going to mess the process up. It, it, it's technical. I, I didn't make the rules. You didn't either. Congress did. Okay, we know how Congress says. So then we go in job duties. What do you use for your job? How much do you walk, stand, sit, climb, bend, all that stuff? Be as accurate as you can. Lifting weight, some people have to. Some people are not lifting anything except maybe a pencil or their, uh, you know, little thing for the your laptop or something. Okay. Since it's my app, the worst I do is pick up my mouse. So there you go. <laughs> so, okay, we're talking ounces. <laughs> Just mark it. There's not right or wrong. Now, this is the important 
there's a lot important. This is important. <laughs> Okay, this whole thing is so technical. That's why we're doing this. So you have to fill out like it says, each doctor, each doctor's address, each doctor's phone number, what they did, and a, when you were first seen, last seen. I got a brain injury. I don't remember exact dates a lot of times. At least put about 2008. Why? Because ARG is going to have to pull these records to establish you have a disability. Why is that important? Because you... We need to know when your disability started to be able to know when you're going to have to do this again to prove you're still disabled. Um, inpatient, emergency room visits, hospital stays if you've had them, outpatient care. Um, now, hearing tests, a lot of this stuff, hearing tests, MRIs, the blood test, most providers now, not all, have a portal, a medical portal that you can pull information on the measure taken, when the last test was done, what did the test show? So, Nowadays, with our technology, most of this information is real easy to get. The more accurate you are, the better chance you have of an easy evaluation. So our tester here, Ms. Angela, had a hearing test. She probably is a copy of it. We're going to submit that when we submit the app. Um, blood tests, maybe they need, maybe they don't need. So, but the hearing test, ARG definitely is going to need. I know that why, because I do this every day. Um, so we're going to submit it. Meds, um, if you have them, um, you're going to submit them. Um, why did you go to the college and grade? The education portion is actually more for Social Security. It meets the criteria, remember, of the app. But in Social Security disability, they look at education. They have these people come in and go, Oh, yeah, you can um, put toothpicks into a, a dispenser to be sealed to sell at the grocery store. ARG does not look at it that way, but you still need to fill out everything honestly. So, um, and we see a lot of this. So, our test situation. Since, since COVID, we have been working from home and my anxiety is less. My distractions are less. I no longer have to share an office, which causes increased distractions. I am able to nap as needed. Um, not having to drive to work reduces the risk of accident due to excessive sleepiness. I am incapable of being anywhere that there may be an excessive crowds or large gathering of people. One interesting thing about um, COVID is it has been enlightening to see where our strengths are if we are in the appropriate setting. Why is that important? That's important because we want to be able to work 
and we want to be able to work successfully. And sometimes it's not always needing a piece of tech to help us be successful. It can be simple observations like we see in this particular scenario. And this will roll into what will be taught down the line classes when we're discussing social security. It also may bring back, remember we have four options for um, type of disability from ARJ. This information, what you provide as much as you can may determine that ARG says, you know what? Maybe you could meet social security criteria. So remember, everything goes both ways. These are unexpected, um, some negative, some positive outcomes. Um, yeah, I don't really have to worry about large groups right now. <laughs> no, a lot of people don't. Um, but that's okay. We learn about ourselves. <laughs> so what we're going to do here, page 12, again, sign, date. More apps get kicked out because they are not signed and dated. Um, the next one, please. So we don't do that page. That's for ARG and the county to do. Now, I recommend, if even if I'm helping you do um, an app, I'm not your designated rep. Why? Because I don't know enough about you generally. If you have a family member or a friend or a spouse who or a child who knows about your disability, who could answer questions if, um, let's say the doctor's office didn't get enough records over, or they're slow, or the records weren't clear, somebody who ARG can talk to, who can explain and verify what your disability is and how it impacts you. I recommend wherever possible you have someone listed. Um, same thing, date, sign. Now, here's where I see enormous problems. So government created this. So these releases and this, these instructions are not in an easy place to correlate. So this is how do you complete the medical releases is at the end of the disability app. It is not listed with the medical releases. So we're going to go over this very specifically because it frustrates everyone, especially applicants. So as you noticed in this sample, the Angela has one, two, three medical providers. So what this says is you have three listed. You're going to do three separate medical releases and then three extra. ARG means that if the county sees or I see you don't have the required amount of releases. You're, this ain't going to go anywhere, and I can't even appeal, you, appeal it for you. You have to follow the specific instructions, even though they're in a weird place. And we at CCDC are always working to have things fine-tuned but you need to watch your releases. Um, 
next, please. Okay, we're going to take a break before we go on. Oh, do you want to do the break, Angela? Sorry, I didn't know I was on mute. Uh, we need to keep pushing because we're running low on time. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. So non-attorney auth. Now, a non-attorney auth, it's a state Medicaid form that permits you to have someone as a non-attorney be able to help you through an appeal, through a Medicaid appeal. So very simple things to do. You put your name, you put your address. If CCDC may choose, have the information to be able to take an appeal into the administrative courts, you must fill the form out exactly as it is. Designate Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, name, address, that's a requirement because we are um, acting as attorneys allowed to in the administrative courts. We also meet um, the requirement for health and human service for unencrypted emails. Um, we really do not take cases into appeal that um, we can't do unencrypted emails. Um, it, it, it's too difficult to have fluid communications. Um, clients are with disabilities are always complaining about access. So we're for it, and we do not use encryption. We respect everything about um, protected health information, but we just can't efficiently work that way. Um, Donna, I think he's got, I think I'm out of order. Sorry. I think we wanted to do the release of information form first, correct? Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. No worries. So we just get non-attorney auth. Now we will actually ask for those releases, the non-attorney auth and the Medicaid third disclosure form before we even agree to work on any cases or generally give information to you. Um, why we can help you if we're hunting down information to help you. So this is the medical release. If, if you had six on your form, like our sample, you are going to have to fill out six of those forms you are going to have to be able to compile six of them, get them into an email if you want us to help you, and packet them to us. Why? Because if we're handling your Medicaid buy-in process, we have to then transfer everything over to the county who has to then submit everything to ARG. We know how to packet it in the most efficient way. We can't packet it if we do not have it. So releases are important. This release, you do not need a copy of your ID. Non-attorney auth, you do not need a copy. So to help you with your disability app, like I had said earlier, if you have um, information, hearing tests, vision tests, um, x-ray results, not the actual x-ray, from your provider's medical portal, 
you'll if I'm representing you and helping you, you're going to get me that information. It definitely helps to make the process go from 90 days. So we may be able to get you your determination in 45 days, half the time if we have the information. Um, right, your condition. So if you have major depressive disorder, for example, you would probably have a medical after visit summary that you could include. If you have meds, you're gonna provide your um, aftercare summary med printout. Remember, okay, providers truthfully, even for social security are really, really slow. So, in this example, we know who our person is. It's an aftercare and what the medications are for. Why? That documents need for meds, need possible side effects. So why you would need accommodations at work or where work is easier in one dynamic. And then... Um, hearing test in this case. So getting your documentation is helpful. It helps you, but they can wait. You know, if you don't want to do that, we don't pressure you. ARG just will try, you know, several times over 90 days to get them. That, that's preference. Um, I suggest you do it because you probably need the insurance and you want, um, especially for long-term care, you, you want to give as much documentation. You're going to have to give it anyway for long-term care or have your doc sign other forms. Um, Sorry, it just says okay. we know it's a lot of information. We're actually at the end, so we can take some questions here. But okay, um, and some of these were comments that I had for Donna when I was filling it out. So um, I really appreciated what she said to me about that. You know, the biggest hardest part is that when you need to apply for this, oftentimes you're under a lot of stress, and it is totally overwhelming. And even though I teach a lot of this stuff, I completely was overwhelmed. To which Donna said, "You have my number," but. That's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it is a lot of information and it will, the presentations will be available. The worksheets will be available. Um, but we have about 15 minutes to run a few questions. Let me pull the ones that seem a little bit more generic or general to everyone. And if we didn't answer it, we'll either get back to you directly um, or it'll be on the Q&A. Um, let me see here. How do I know what date I was determined disabled? So if you remember the slide that had um, how you were determined, on there's usually another sheet of paper that'll give you what's called your diary date. Your diary date you have one first, if you're on social security disability or for state disability, and it'll say, um, we have determined you disabled from this date because that's really important because, and like social security, usually it's three, five or seven years, um, you you have to be redetermined. So that gives you a gauge. It, it's a really helpful thing. If you want to go to DVR for help, it, it really helps. I believe it was the second page of this one that you gave to me, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. 
Um, what if you don't have a doctor? Um, if you don't have a doctor, then ARG will can send you to a doctor, just like Social Security does to eva a third party evaluation. It shouldn't be that hard to find doctors now, especially um, once your Medicaid app goes in, the, your doctors will usually take them. COVID is not an excuse um, for doing your redetermination part. Medic, the state, the feds have been so easy and flexible with having so many things electronically and telemedicine and Zoom and um, Microsoft Teams and a bunch of others. There's usually no problem with getting a doctor. What does not need, who does not need to do a disability determination? If you're on SSI or SSDI. All right. Um, what if the person stops working? How long does a person have to find another job? Um, Non-COVID times about 15 days. COVID time, remember, we are um, in extended benefits. So you wouldn't get kicked off till the health emergency ends. These are things we are always, not just CCDs, the other partners, people on these benefits are always trying to have addressed and always trying to see, can we get extensions or realistic timelines? Right now, it's hard to find a job. It wasn't a year ago as hard. So that's frustrating, but that's the only way I can answer it. You're protected right now. Um, Jennifer, why don't you unmute yourself? She needed a little more clarification, and I don't think I read the question right. Okay. Here I am. Um, there you are. <laughs> so my disability is a brain injury, so I have a bit of challenge with memory and focus. Um, but you said you showed some forms, Donna, about how do I know the date of my SSDI determination. I, I, I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to know the date of when I got my SSDI determination. Oh, I see. So when you're filling out the Medicaid buy-in, the Medicaid app, is that where where it said? Um, you got SSDI, SSI, you would put your approved. You know what I put, truthfully? I put, I have a brain injury. I'm not sure okay. it's about. So, and, and they're easily verifiable. Um, it's okay to use the word about. Okay. It's okay to say, I have a brain injury. I don't have a clue. I'm missing years of chunks of memory. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I know when I I know when I first when I got my first deposit from SSDI, I have I can look in my bank and look up that. That's that's the date I have. So I guess I can use that date and say around that time. Yeah, that's it. Just people with certain disabilities. The ARG and, and most counties honestly understand the basics of disability. And like if you were working with us and you submitted, we have, we're privately funded orgs. So please do not misunderstand when I say we work with a lot of counties mm -hmm. in the state who will come to us and go, hey, can can you get some more specifics? 
Mm -hmm. or um, is this a good estimate? They will ask questions. There, most people are not out to um, inhibit the benefit. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Uh, Kevin has a lot of questions, but I think they're more individual to him. Um, although he was, you know, one of them I think that would be relevant would be if you're on if you're on a program like 1619B, do you want to switch? Should you switch? Or why would you switch? Okay. My if I were counseling someone um processing it, one I think you take into consideration age, disability. Were you in um, crisis in um, the last year, meaning did you have to go to the hospital? Was it simple? Do you tend to need high levels of care? Could you in any possible way be SSDI eligible so you would have Medicare, Medicaid. It, it's so specific um, to having that counseling time to go over each person's situation. I can't say yes or no what's going to work for someone. I can only give you facts. Right now, like... You know, as that limits, if you're on SSI, you're meeting those requirements uh, through your subsidy, your always possibly trust. Some things you got to, we can talk through, but you actually have to make those decisions. Um, yeah, that's why I got overwhelmed. Okay, uh, Julie says, did I understand that if one is not already on SSI, SSDI, then the 3368 must be filled out concurrently with the Medicaid buy-in? Is that the disability determination 3368? Julie Hart, you can unmute yourself. If you I don't know what the form number is. I just <laughs> know it's state disability determination app. Looks like we might have. Yes, Julie, hi, um, Donna. Thanks so much for all your information. Yeah, the 3368 is the disability application. Ah, yes. Yeah, so thanks for that. Not on SSI or SSDI. Yes, that is required to be filled out to be Medicaid buy-in um, eligible. Thank you. Um, this is Brenda. Angela, can I just make a statement? Yes, please. Ah, thank you. Um, thank you, Donna. Your expertise on this is so valuable. And um, it's so valuable. And I think that um, it's important that everyone know that the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition is doing these webinars to educate us, all of us, educate you to educate us. We are also, um, we want people to join our organization as a really simple application that is online. And if for any reason you can't join online, um, you can um, call in and Angela will give you that number. And I bring this up because like um, Donna just said, there's so many things that are individualized that we can't answer all of the questions. And you deserve to have someone who um, can sit with you and, and understand your specific situation and get some answers. So um, in my heart, I have a goal. Um, for CCDC, they've been around for 30 years. They've been doing this. We're excited about this whole webinar series, and we see it going all year, bringing information to you. And I would ask that you consider joining CCDC. Donna said something earlier, too, about Congress, about legislation. We need voices 
we need a large number of voices to make sure that those Congress people and those letter legislators know that we will be heard. As you heard Donna say, buy-in, Medicaid buy-in, they can keep it or they can change it. And so what's important, so what is so important is that we start building a coalition at CCDC. My goal would be that we have over 50,000 people so that our senators and our representatives, they hear us. And so if you, if you have the time and if you would take the energy to consider joining us um, as a member, we, we really would um, appreciate that. Thanks, Angela. You bet. Thank you, Brenda. And we're just about out of time. Um, there were a few requests for links. I will send those to you all. Um, you'll get a couple emails from us. Afterwards, we're going to send out another survey and would appreciate uh, your responses. It's short, sweet, and unpainful. Uh, is that a word? Unpainful? It is now. Um, and so... Um, if you, you know, if afterwards you're thinking about it, you have more questions, absolutely. Um, please connect hey, with Angela. Me. Yes. Um, I saw I saw a chat that came, I heard a chat that came in. Could you also mention what's going to happen the next two months with the certified work incentive coordinators? Uh, right. yes. Yeah. So we have um next month we're starting a two-month session. Um, it'll be cut into two, just sort of like the Medicaid was where we're going to be talking about benefits and how it interacts with you work with your work, other route. Hmm, yeah, maybe I can't other resources that you can utilize um, all kinds of good stuff. So we're very excited about the next two sessions. The links go out frequently in um, the update that I do either uh, weekly or twice weekly. So again, joining as a member gets you access to that updated information. Um, and they, they are, they're very excited. For those who signed up, just to, if anybody here signed up for the transportation webinar, we are gonna move that just so that we could allow more time um, for the benefits session uh, as well. And then Can I my, just add? Oh, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, we're on the benefit one. Um, the, the individuals that, the individual who will be speaking is certified. Social Security has a certification program where they train the people on Social Security benefits. So you're going to get some valuable and very important information so that you can make a choice about working, an informed choice. So you have the information. Thanks. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Brenda. Um, one last piece and then I'll let y'all go. Um, we start our revised and revamped basic advocacy training program next week is this, the launch of a five week, three hour, uh, one day a week, three hours for each day, um, session on basic advocacy skills. At the end of the session of each session, the last 20 minutes or so, you get to do a Q&A with individuals who are subject matter experts and have lived experience in the topics that we're talking about. So again, if you have any questions or you want to know more about that, give me an email. It's just a nevin, N-E-V-I-N, at ccdconline.org. And you should have gotten it in all of the reminders I sent anyway. So um, shoot us an email if you have questions. And if not, we look forward to seeing you next month. Anything else, guys, that you want to add? Donna? Don? All right. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Bye. Bye.